Developing video games is tough, but for all the work that goes into graphics, sound, gameplay, and programming, the controller is one's main gateway to appreciating it all. Even the greatest games can be mired by terrible controllers. So of course, we're going to be taking a look at 15 of the most horrendous controllers of all time, and what made them so uniquely awful. Xbox Duke For the record, original Xbox controllers were not frisbees. After all, throwing a frisbee at someone wouldn't knock them out cold like the Duke would. Such was the weight and thickness that the OG Xbox controller possessed. If nothing else, it was solid and suited incredibly large hands. And really, there was just nothing else. At least Microsoft redesigned the controller to be smaller and more comfortable down the line. Sega Activator no accessories list is complete without mentioning Sega. So say hello to the Sega Activator, a full body motion controller that used infrared beams to capture player movement. This basically translated to standing in a weird ring and flailing about in Eternal Champions, Comic Zone, or even Mortal Kombat on the Genesis. That's because, despite the innovation that the Activator possessed, it didn't have any dedicated games, not to mention it cost $80. Six Axis the DualShock 3 was fairly successful for Sony despite its problems, but the 6-axis, its wireless predecessor, was the pits. Due to Sony being embroiled in a lawsuit with Immersion Incorporation, leading to the removal of Rumble for the DualShock 3, 6-axis was touted as the future. It essentially amounted to waving the controller around in games like Lair or awkwardly turning valves in Killzone 2. Sony would go on to replace the 6-axis with the DualShock 3, which mercifully contained Rumble. Atari Jaguar Controller Look, we're sure there's a reason why the Atari Jaguar's controller looks like a keypad fused with a controller, but playing games cannot possibly be this reason. Not only were the smaller keys excessive, but they were ultimately useless. Games like Alien vs Predator that used the keypad went with an overlay as opposed to every single button. Hilariously, Atari would release a Pro Controller version which had even more buttons and triggers. Intel Wireless Series Gamepad this is not a controller. This is an emergency flotation device that could potentially double up as an alternative controller challenge in Sekiro. You could argue about holding it as you would a steering wheel and play normally. You could also use any other controller or a mouse and keyboard and achieve vastly superior results without finagling a misshapen blue boomerang. That's also an option. Nintendo Power Glove when the Power Glove was showcased in The Wizard, a film about tournaments and hustling people through video games, produced by the family-friendly Nintendo no less, it immediately caught the public eye, which is a nice way of saying that it had many questioning how this abomination could possibly play games. Weird number buttons on the top, motion controls, all of this was so intuitive to use and imprecise that the trademark, it's so bad, would live on in more ways than one. Xbox 360 Connect. The appeal of the Kinect's controllerless motion control was understandable, but for all the hype, Cirque du Soleil performances, and awkward smoke and mirrors demos, the launch reality was far different. It felt laggy at times and required a fairly large amount of space to even work properly. Nevertheless, despite the sparse lineup of games, Kinect was a massive success. Now Kinect for the Xbox One? Well that's a whole other story. Nintendo Wii U Gamepad Following up the massive success of the Wii, Nintendo took the next obvious step forward for motion control gaming, saddling it with a thick gamepad, complete with its own underwhelming screen. Not only was the Wii U gamepad fairly situational, but it didn't enhance the core appeal of the Wii at all. That's not counting all the issues it had with battery life or its user interface. It wasn't all for naught though. The Wii U's concepts were carried over and improved with the Nintendo Switch, which has been very successful for the company. Philips CDI Game Controllers At one point, Philips made its own optical disc format called the CDI, whose two main claims to fame were the awful controllers and the even more awful but still hilarious Zelda titles. As difficult as it was to believe, some of us didn't want a controller that looked like a trackpad attached to a scanner like the CDI Player 400 offered. Despite this, the CDI still hung around for a good 8 years. Sega Dreamcast Controller for as amazing as the Dreamcast's games were, the controller had some issues. First off, it felt unnecessarily bulky. This was primarily because of its VMU, which was a memory card that also doubled up as its own device, sporting mini games like Sonic Adventure's Chao Adventure, a clock, and even second screen functions. Even without the VMU, the controller's design felt awkward to handle overall. Game Track 
GameTrack seemed poised to offer position tracking in 3D with its controllers. At least, that was the idea. When you hear about all the retracting cables, ball joints, and numerous GameTrack titles that were supposed to release back in the day, well, the idea becomes a bit muddier. GameTrack seemed like a gimmick propped up on lame commercials, but at least its creator, Elliot Myers, seemed enthusiastic enough about it. That's gotta count for something, right? Atari 5200 Controller one look at the Atari 5200's controller offers enough evidence for why the Jaguar turned out so horrible. Even with the pause button, a revelation back in the day, the controller featured shabby materials for centering its joystick. This meant that it would never reliably self-center, causing problems for just about every game. Atari would work on a better self-centering version, but it never released. And again, this doesn't even begin to mention the horrible keypad buttons. Intellivision Controller Oh look, another console that thought it was a good idea to have a numeric keypad for its controller. The Intellivision controller was especially unique for having a control disc, which was a fancy name for its directional pad that also served as a paddle. It looked terrible, and it felt terrible. Next. Nintendo 64 controller. Personally, I love the Nintendo 64 and the sheer number of amazing titles that it offered. That being said, the controller design was something else. The trident shape made it so that only the joystick or the analog pad could be used at a time, which worked for many titles, but it took some major getting used to despite the overall responsiveness of the controls. There was also just no getting over that strange feeling of finally using the analog pad after months, possibly years of leaving it unused. Neo Geo Mini Lest you think terrible controllers aren't still being made, we have the Neo Geo Mini. Though it's actually a mini arcade cabinet, therein lies the core problem. It's meant to pack all the functionality of an arcade cabinet into a tiny device. Lack of clicky buttons was the least of your problems here, but hey, if you purchased the Neo Geo Arcade Stick Pro, which is actually pretty awesome, you could plug that into the Neo Geo Mini and play it on the miniature screen in true arcade fashion. And that wraps it up. If you like what we're doing, please consider subscribing to our channel. We upload new videos daily. Also, don't forget to switch on the bell notification icon, that way you don't miss out on any of our videos.